My name is Alex Kippis. I'm the executive director of Rebuild Woonsocket, uh, which is one of the organizations co-hosting today's event. Uh, and I will be your MC this afternoon. Who's excited to be out here today? So I just wanted to speak briefly tonight uh, so you know what to expect for the festivities uh, before handing it off to some of our amazing performers and speakers uh, who are joining us this afternoon. So uh, please, over the course of the next two hours, check out the amazing tables from the organizations around the park um, that have been set up to uh, hand out resources, hand out information, um, all of that stuff. There's, uh, we also have community art project going on over there. Um, and at the Rebuild One Socket table, which is one half of this long one, uh, there's water on, uh, actually there's water in the red cooler next to it, uh, as well as voter registration forms uh, and a sign up sheet to get on our email list. So all the important food groups. Uh, so the stage is going to be active with performers and speakers from now until about 5.15 or 5.30, um, probably more like 5.30. And then we're going to take a 15 minute break where we'll play some background music and invite you to check out all the tables, um, make some art, and take part in today's first training, which is going to be offered by Safe Haven, um, which is set up over there with the red tablecloth. Uh, Safe Haven is a community care alliance uh, drop-in center here in Woonsocket that does outreach uh, to the unhoused and harm reduction work. Uh, we're going to be doing a Narcan training over there. Uh, it's available whenever you want to go over there. Um, and I'm going to specifically stress if you want to do a larger training during that, that break. Um, it's really important to learn how to recognize overdose and learn how to administer Narcan. I carry it around in my car with me at all times and it's an important thing for everybody to do. So then we'll come back uh, to more speakers and performances from about 5.45 to 6.15 or maybe 6.30. Uh, and then we'll switch to some background music uh, and round out the program with a second training given by yours truly about state and local government and how that works. Um, if the weather does hold out or improve, uh, and folks want to keep the party going, we can stick around past 6.30, we have the park till 8, so we can continue with music and celebrations. Um, so before we start today's activities, I did have two quick favors to ask. The first one is please take pictures and videos while you're here. Uh, we want to capture this beautiful day from as many perspectives as possible, uh, and after the event, we're going to put out a call by email and social media uh, and see if folks want to send us pictures and videos to share. Uh, the second favor, is please consider uh, donating to support Rebuild Woonsocket's work. We're a grassroots organization fighting to reorient our city's politics and create a better, more just future. Uh, it takes all of us to do that, and that means everything from knocking doors, making calls, donating money, um, getting involved in any of the community organizations that you see here. Um, if you can, there is a QR code at our table, which is the table with all the pride flags over there, um, and also a little bucket to, to, to make cash donations. Um, today's event is totally free for our community, as you know, uh, but it's costing us a lot of money, and we are by and for the people, and so please consider contributing while you're here today. Uh, lastly, a couple of administrative things. Bathrooms are back there. It's the green, uh, the roof, green roofed building back there. The bathrooms are open until 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, and there are trash and recycle bins around the park, so please make sure trash and recycling ends up there. That's it for me for right now. So, so next up, uh, we have a speaker for you. Um, it is activist, bisexual, and my close friend, Senator Cynthia Mendes. place I would rather be celebrating pride than right here with you all in Woonsocket. Uh, my name is Cynthia Mendes um, and I wanted to share a little bit with you about um, my background and one thing that I'm kind of a grounding myself in particularly through these very um, intense and violent times. Um, I actually grew up in organized religion and Christianity and as we know, is one of the biggest culprits in this country right now for oppression and violence and, um, and for marginalizing our queer community. Um, and then I made uh, a pivot to another oppressive institution, which is state government. Um, and, and 
which is also historically marginalized people. And so one of the things that I uh, remember um, being in the State House, one of the first things that I remember my first year there was we made some rules about the way that you could show up in that space. They made rules about what we could dress like, what we could wear, they, and they were very gender specific. Um, and I remember being really upset about that. I remember finding ways to be really subversive and kind of changing what I wear and changing the way I, I present it sometimes. But I remember really feeling like, is this what it's like? That all the, the power, the institutions that have power in this country have decided who we are and how we, ha how we present it. And I started thinking about the word marginalized and how many of us, because of our gender, or our sexuality, or our race, we consider and we are marginalized. But what we don't talk about is who the fuck is marginalizing us? Who has put us and relegated us to the outside? And what I love about this community, what I love about our people, is that we, with such bravery, broaden the margins. And in the margins, we find community, we find welcoming, we find all the things that the institutions that somehow drew a line and said, you're in here and you're out there. We say, out, we'll show you out. We'll show you pride, we'll show you love, and we'll show you community. And so one of the things that I, I know that is very hard sometimes, I wanted to share this as far as what is keeping me going and keeping me grounded. Um, sometimes it's hard to look at your newsfeed. Sometimes it's hard to look at social media. Sometimes it's hard to turn on the TV or watch the news. Um, and sometimes it's even hard to be around family and that's why we have our chosen family. Um, and one of the things that I have, I want to ground us is that is truly, truly powerful. More powerful, I would say, than the people that think they have all the power, whether it be in the state house or in um, organized religion. We have the power of love. We have the power of acceptance. We have the power of grace and including each other when no one else will. And the reason why I know that is really powerful is not just because of my story, but it's because of every single person in here that's here right now, that feels comfortable to be here right now, is because you know this space loves you. This space accepts you. This space makes grace for you. This space makes this place makes space for you. And that is powerful. And the more that we do that for each other, the more that we continue to love each other, the more that we continue to expand that space and take that with us everywhere we go, we're going to push the oppressive systems into the margins. We're going to push them into the places where they have no place to go. And we're going to shrink them until we make the way that we live the law of the land, which is love. And I'm excited about doing that with the, with the people in this space. And so do not let yourself feel despair. Do not let yourself um, feel disheartened and discouraged, um, as we often do. And when you do feel that way, go to the person that you know accepts you. Go to the people that you know that love you. And be reminded, they're not just, they're not just somebody that loves you. That is somebody that is changing the game. They're changing the way that we exist in this space. And we gotta continue to do that for each other. And so um, some of the most powerful things that we have in our, in our toolkit to continue to build power is love, acceptance, grace, and community. We're doing that now. We're gonna do that in our workplaces. We're gonna do that in our education spaces. We're gonna do that in our neighborhoods. And we're gonna continue to do that. I'm sending you all love. I'm receiving it tenfold. And I'm really, really great, grateful to be a part of this community. Let's change this world and let's change it with love. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Can I have another round of applause for Cynthia? Uh, next up, we have Jen Work, an activist and co-founder of the Rhode Island Political Cooperative and my close friend. Give it up for Jen. I'm all right sometimes. Okay, so I don't know if y'all remember me from last year, but I was up here with my son, and he couldn't make it today because he's working. Um, but I hate giving speeches. I said that last time. I say it every single time. I hate giving speeches. Y'all know it's true. I hate this. And I usually start off my speech during Pride by saying love is love because it's true. Love is love, right? 
But I've been so fucking mad. I'm sorry to the children. I'm sorry. I cuss a lot. I apologize. But I can't help it. There has been some fucked up shit happening in our country. There are some people who don't understand that love is love. And it really pisses me off. I'm not an ally. I'm not here to say, like, you know, this is great. Everything's fine. I'm a motherfucking accomplice because we need to burn some shit down. We don't want to go to jail because jail's not fun, but don't take it in a literal sense, okay? But this shit is really fucked up. You should be able to turn to the person next to you, the person that you see on a daily basis, the person that makes your heart flutter and say, I love you. No matter what that person looks like, no matter what color their hair is, no matter how they identify. So, what I want everyone to do is put one finger up, not the middle one. Take one finger. Everyone take one finger and point it at yourself. And say, self, we're about to fuck some shit up. Keep pointing. I love myself. And I want people to love me. So I'm going to do whatever it takes for people to accept me for me. Now point to the person next to you, just one person, and not the middle finger, and say, person, I will fight for you. You should be able to love whomever you want to love. Let's fuck shit up. Okay. And I just have one favor. I need everyone to go into their pocket. Everybody got some change. You got some change. I don't care if it's two cents. I don't care if it's two dollars. I don't care if it's twenty dollars. There are organizations around this park who are fighting. And they could use your help. And you may not think that two cents is a lot or 25 cents is a lot or two dollars. But that shit adds up quickly. So whatever change you have in your pocket, I know there's a box for, where is it? For um, what's I could build over there? Donate. But make sure you get registered to vote and be prepared to burn some shit up. Okay? I love y'all. Thank you so much, Jen. So next up, um, our next speaker is Autumn Rain Johnson, Miss Wheelchair Rhode Island 2023. Give it up for her. Hi everyone, I'm Autumn Rain Johnson, Miss Wheel Miss Wheelchair RI 2023. And first off, I just want to uh, read my. Um, what my uh, platform is here uh, as Miss Wheelchair Rhode Island 2023. So I represent our small but mighty state by using my platform to advocate, mentor, and speak out to the youth and adults with unique abilities. I, that's what I refer to disabilities as because I think that disabilities adds a negative meaning to what I have and so I think that unique abilities uplifts and empowers us. Um, I also use my platform to also uh, help those that are struggling, um, that are young adults that are struggling to um, transition into adulthood. Uh, me, as a person with spina bifida, I personally uh, I felt lost after high school back in 2018. So now I have that passion to help others that may feel the same way as me. I also am working towards a bachelor's degree at College Unbound in Organizational Leadership and Change. And I dedicate time to the Rhode Island Parent Information Network. And who uh, and here we, ha we all have experience car uh, caring and advocating for those with unique abilities. And um, so doing all of that, I, I like to let people know within everything that I do that they can live a happy and successful life, but also learn how to overcome obstacles along the way. Lastly, I am a Narragansett Indian, um, a part of the Narragansett Indian tribe, and so I aim to also support and advocate for tribal members 
in the Narragansett indigenous community while also raising awareness to the issues that indigenous people face. And that is all I have to share. Thank you so much, Autumn. Thank you for being here. Can I have another round of applause? Um, so first off, I want to invite my friend Leah Pfeiffer, uh, who's a Winsaki local artist, a peer support specialist, and community healthcare worker with a long history of advocacy for trans and gender non-conforming youth and students working with the town of Cumberland and Beacon Charter for policies that protect the trans students. A public speaker at events in collaboration with David Cicilline and the TGI Network, a protest organizer, a member of the Community Track Planning Board for the Rhode Island Trans Conference, and of course, a planning committee member for Woonsocket Pride. Please welcome Leah. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for sticking around with the cold. Me and Alex put all of our energy into like praying that there would be no rain and not the cold. <laughs> so thank you for hanging out. Um, I am going to read off of my phone because we love accessibility here. Um, but yes, my name is Leah Pfeiffer. Um, my pronouns are she, her in a gay way and he, him in a butch way. Um, I'm a bisexual, genderqueer, transsexual troublemaker um, here from Woonsocket. <laughs> Um, as a peer support specialist, I come from a background of lived experience as a trans youth that had child protective services involved in my home and been through the psychiatric system. I was a partial ward of the state of Rhode Island and I'm a domestic, sexual, and child abuse survivor. Um, I was frequently over institutionalized as a minor because I was a trans youth in distress. And there are going to be many, many, many more trans youth in distress, just like me, if we don't do something. Um, my body was controlled by the state because my transition was debated in DCYF court. My doctors testified on my behalf that permission to transition would save my life. Me making pleas to my lawyers and social workers to help me. And my movement was controlled by the various hospitals that I was sent to and my DCYF workers, lawyers, and judges told me I couldn't tell anyone what was happening to me. And I am just one of many person, and out of who knows how many more, that can't speak out, couldn't speak out, or won't be able to speak out. The state has absolutely no right to trans people's bodies, and especially trans children. We cannot send more trans children into traumatic situations that will cause them to be involved with DCYF, and psychiatric institutes in places like Texas and Florida that will put them at serious risk for discrimination, violence, and suicide. Children, cis, and trans have a right to their bodies, their names, how they dress, and what they want to be called from the second that they are born. We must shut down the American idea that parents have the right to control and own their children. The human rights of a child, including the rights to socially and medically transition, exist under the age of 18, and not letting a trans child transition is child abuse, period. We have to do everything we can for trans people and to help trans kids become trans adults. It horrifies me to think about how I felt when I wasn't allowed to transition, and that another young trans person will have to go to family court and beg for their rights as enacted by Rob DeSantis in the state of Florida where they are trying to remove trans children from their homes. The genocidal, yeah. <laughs> the genocidal efforts to eradicate healthcare, queer history, and disrupt the families of trans children make me feel like I'm reliving it all. It is difficult to hear and hard to face, but the United States is a fascist state, regardless of who gets elected. We are living in a fascist operation. The sooner that we can come to terms with this, the sooner we can face it and we can fight it. We can confront trans genocide and persecution and we can destroy fascism before it is too late. And if we do this, we can survive it. Our communities have faced this before. In the face of the AIDS crisis, gay and trans people invented harm reduction. Black folks have created systems of mutual aid out of the need to help others flee slavery, sorry, flee slave slavery and survive white supremacy when black communities have been purposefully depleted of resources and targeted with drugs and violence. 
Indigenous people were killed when they were colonized in so-called America and enslaved in the Caribbean, which set us up for these systems that we fight today. And how you can heal and survive this is to connect with your community as much as you possibly can. Volunteer, feed people, talk to your neighbors, become an advocate, start little community pro projects, if not to just bring people around your kitchen table. And we need every one of us to survive, especially those who can use some of their privilege to help people out. Everybody can do something, no matter how big or small, every moment of queer joy and success matters. I live the city of Woonsocket, and I feel like the queer population gets erased here. And the politicians in Woonsocket don't give a damn about the basic needs of people who depend on them under their municipality for things as simple as affordable housing, permanent long-term housing programs, free public transit, food access, the needs for healthcare and of healthcare providers, continuing to maintain free COVID testing and treatment, or environmental safety, such as here in Woonsocket. And if they don't care about these things, do you think they're going to use their position for queer human rights? No. No. <laughs> I want rights for gender-affirming health care to minors and adults codified in Rhode Island, and I want Democrats to step up and disrupt like they say they will. And to politicians and the city council in one socket, if you disagree with what I'm saying, fucking prove me wrong. It's time. Prove us wrong if you're tired of us complaining and you're tired of us saying this and slandering you. Prove us wrong. And I have nothing more to say to politicians. <laughs> um, but what I do have to say is to trans kids and trans youth, I'm so sorry that this is happening to you. Um, it happened to me in private with barely any justice and trans children are now going to have to face this with vicious visibility. Um, and that's even scarier, but I did this too, and I am so happy that I stuck around. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Woo! Woo! Love you. Love you. It was so hard um, to stay alive, but I have the most beautiful life um, with two beautiful par partners, um, a wonderful sibling, mother, and stepdad, um, a dog, and a home of my own that is full of safety and love such joy and gratitude to just be a transgender person um, and to kids that are struggling someday when you are older being trans will feel like that most precious gift that life has ever given to you and you will have it too um, just please stay with us um, trans adults love you parents that are allies that are out there love you too and I will do everything to fight for you for as long as it takes, even if it takes the rest of my life. Um, so please believe in yourself, and especially in the month of Pride, be proud of how strong you are, and I'm so happy to see you here on Earth with us, so please stay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leia. Up next, we have, we have Marlene Guy. Uh, board member and treasurer of Rebuild Woonsocket, a Woonsocket community advocate and a staunch ally of the LGBTQ community and my close personal friend. Welcome, Marlene. Hi, everyone. I am going to be very brief because uh, Alex kind of convinced me to speak at the last minute. Because uh, he kind of does that. You all are here for the same reasons. Um, most of you guys know me. Uh, I have been uh, supporting the city of Woonsocket for a very long time in a variety of capacities. Um, and so most of you guys know that I have uh, taken head on some political power in the city uh, that is not very supportive of our community. And I think that that is uh, important to highlight. But Today I wanted to actually speak a little bit on the joy piece and the reason I think it's really important to highlight that a lot of this gets attention. We are just in day three of Pride Month and we highlight the stories and the heartache and the pain uh, and the joy that is part of this community, um, particularly in this city. But I want to highlight 
the fact that things happen outside of this month, and as an ally, as um, as well, Jen, you called it a, a rabble rouser, an what accomplice. an accomplice. Okay. Um, so I, I think that it's really important that outside of these spaces, pride has a lot more to do than just where rainbow flags and. Um, the joy, really highlighting the challenges that brought us here, the fight that needed to happen to even be on these stages and having these conversations, the fight that is still happening, um, the pain and the heartache that is being brought on to people who just want to be, just who they are, when they are, how they love, who they love, um, and there's a lot of people who think they have the right to be able to help make that decision. And so, as a white cis woman, and I'm standing here acknowledging the fact that I am the parent and aunt of many young people who are facing bigger, broader challenges, um, I have to say that there's power in what I have and having to own that privilege. And so many of you guys know that I, in a few months, am going to be married, and I'm very excited about that. But there's power in that. And the fact that over the last year, we have taken our power in going to places and choosing what we want to do and how we want to do it and when we want to do it. And all of it has been embraced in love. And that means that there has been spaces we have gone to and left and said, are our entire community, are all of our friends, are all of our families going to feel welcome in this space? And if the answer is no, then they don't get our money. They don't get to be able to be part of our day because we need to be able to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to dance with who they want to, love who they want to, and help us celebrate. I don't want anything happening or being fearful in any situation that I have any part in. And so that's above and beyond this time. It's above and beyond just this month. And I see a lot of how can I say it nicely? Should I say it nicely? <laughs> Just some showboating, I think, is part of it. It's the people who show up because there's special elections. There's people who are showing up because they have somebody to appease so they can make a picture with somebody with a flag in the background and not actually be here and fighting for the community on a regular basis. Are they willing to put their own personal dime up for it? Are they willing to sacrifice things that they want or need for it? And I think that we need to start holding our political powers accountable in all levels because they do a lot of show voting and a lot of talking. And over this next 27 days, we're going to see a lot of people taking a lot of pictures that are just bullshit. <laughs> and quite frankly, we need to start saying something about it because it's apparent that they're using the power that we have and we just need to take it the fuck back quite Woo! frankly yes. so i love you guys i'm so glad that we're here i'm so happy you guys embraced this weather because you know it's new england and all but um i will continue to fight i will continue to make choices that will keep my family my community safe um and i hope that we will continue to pushing the needle forward. Love you guys. Thank you so much, Marlene. All right, next up, we have Damien Nathaniel, a local poet and artist here to perform spoken word. Give it up for Damien. Hello. I don't know if you all can tell by looking at me, but I'm transgender. If you can't tell which direction, that's fine. What you might not know is I am also a vampire. So I have a poem about how I'm a vampire. It is called Vampires. I am not so much boy as I am blood. I am not so much girl as I am eh. Now I live in this space of onomatopoeia where the only way I can describe myself is by pretending I'm an Italian choking on garlic. Kind of like a vampire invited to dinner at the in-laws. I'm a vague gesturing of hands and a noise made when you can't form words. I mean, I 
could use a string of labels to try and describe myself, but most of those are in a dead language that only those of the alphabet understand. You really can't comprehend all that I am because I am endless and expanding like the myths of vampires. What used to be cannot go out into the sun has become glittering sun skin when caught in the rays. What used to be looking like knocking on death's door has become glamorous, shirtless, ageless attraction. Vampires used to elicit fear in the locals of some small Romanian towns, and now they are a sex symbol that preteen girls squeal over. I don't want to be a sex symbol. I don't want people to be attracted to me for my misfortune of being born into a world that doesn't understand me. I am not this newfangled vampire that can exist in day and night. I'm not the best of both worlds. I, and I'm using my hands again, making gestures that only a certain group of people actually understand. You know, I'm tired of having this bell attached to my hand as I'm buried six feet deep into the ground underneath a world that is so afraid of my existence that it feels the need to pass laws about my body. And now the question arises, what time period am I talking about anymore? Because I started by talking about vampires in the 17th century, and I was comparing them to Robert Pattinson in 2008, and now it seems I'm referring to something that just happened yesterday. And maybe that's a new way to describe myself. My existence is timeless. And it's impossible to imagine that something that would have once branded me as closer to God has become something that makes me less than human. Maybe I should embrace that people desire me for what body parts I choose to keep. Maybe I should embrace that something of mine grew like the fangs of a vampire when I decided to change. Or maybe I should embrace that that thing in my blood that supposedly gives me an advantage. Lawmakers think I'm impossibly strong. They think I'm impossibly fast. They think I'm so beautiful that I am better than those naturally bestowed with these hormones. Maybe I should just accept that society can't decide if it wants me more bleh or eh. It can't decide if it wants me dead or undead. It just wants me to be quiet about it. And I've got one more poem if y'all will hear it. This one is instead about aliens. It's called XY and XX. Imagine it is the year 20 million and 23 and aliens have found Earth. If humans still existed, you might have heard about this on the news, but many millennia have passed without new footprints being left. Because at some point in the past, there was an explosion that cannot be described, that left our part of the galaxy with no sunlight and thus no life. But sediment still forms and bodies get preserved and the aliens, like our own archaeologists, are trying to put together the pieces of a lost world. They found their first skeletons. I'm going to call them Adam and Eve. And with Adam and Eve, the aliens unravel the code of DNA and with DNA the aliens find what we call XY and XX. Now the aliens keep unearthing and finding new mysteries. Mysteries like the pyramids juxtaposed with Tokyo Tower, stone quarries next to skyscrapers, little towns at the base of volcanoes, evidence of an ocean, though it's no longer there to be seen. We must look like an incredibly fucking confused species to be living with tiny apex predators, to have domesticated sharp fangs, to have placed towns in flood zones and on fault lines, to have homes built of straw and sticks and bricks, but none are more confused than these aliens. They thought that with Adam and Eve they had cracked the code, that they had figured out this binary sex system that we seem to worship with our many technologies. They thought they had us figured out. But then, these aliens found me. The aliens looked in the most mundane place for the most common of people, and they found me. A clusterfuck of characteristics. A wrench in the system. A question for scholars to discuss over dinner and to present at their alien conferences about alien worlds. They think they found another Eve with the DNA coding and the XX factor. But upon closer inspection of my amazingly preserved body, 
They will find that like Adam, I have no womb. They will find bones that are not stretched to their potential. They will not find Eve sacked a fat upon my chest. They will recreate my vocal cords. They will play back a sound they think of as me and wonder why Adam has an apple in his throat, but I do not. You know, I'm having so much fun imagining these few future archaeologist aliens. I mean, 19,999,000 years from now, on another world, in another galaxy, I will be for them what Lucy is to us, begging that they ask more questions before naming things as fact. They will have lost our books and our technologies, but they will continue to make their educated best guess, and I will be a new mystery to be solved. They'll end up finding more like me. Discovering that 2% of this planet's population are like me. We are gender fuck and queer and we are the next wonder of the universe. The next question that will never be answered because they are not living here and now. So let these aliens discuss us over dinner. Let us be the reason they need to rewrite their textbooks every year. Let us be dubbed ethereal and placed in museums for the next generation of adventurers to see. Let us open minds to something new, something beyond a binary, something beyond comprehension, something beyond what this society is categorized as XY and XX. We have Kate Montero, a longtime civil rights activist, a community historian, and a member of the board of Rhode Island Pride. Give it up for Kate. Come on, Kate! Woo! Hello and sock it! You are few left, but you are hearty. You are strong. You are here. I hear that my favorite mayor is still your mayor. I was looking forward to not mentioning her today, but apparently someone mentioned something about a vampire recently, and you have an undead mayor. I have a question for you. Why is Lisa not angry that you are here today? Why didn't Lisa program something against you? Why? You need to be loud and you need to be strong. And if they are not angry about you, you aren't doing your job. So a year from now, if you all ask me to come back, I want there to be people so angry that you are holding your fourth LGBTQ pride in Woonsocket. There are a heck of a lot of people out there who think this is brand new, who think you are new, who think, ah, uh, back when they were kids, there were no transgendered people. Back when they were kids, there weren't gays and lesbians like they are all over the place. Well, you know what? That is, you should forgive the expression bullshit. Let me tell you about one socket. Let me tell you about shoulders that you stand on. After World War II, now, there were gay people, there were lesbians, there were queer people of all stripes in one socket before World War II. But I'm going to take you back to just after World War II. Just after World War II, Rita Poe was running a, a club, the Palm Court that was queer friendly, it better be queer friendly, the owner was Margaret Figueroa was running the Mirror Bar, which was a piano bar and cocktail bar in Woonsocket, queer friendly, eventually owned by Bob Tebow. There was a club called the Zanzibar. I love that name. The Zanzibar was, had, had the kind of things where people would have a wedding reception or the Elks Club or Rotary Club luncheon at. And then at night, after they all went home, the gays would dance. 
There might have been some other gambling and some other stuff going on in one or two of those clubs, particularly the Zanzibar, but they were queer friendly and there were queers there. And the city of Woonsocket, the mayor and the police chief and the public safety chief decided they didn't like that very much. They decided people were coming to Woonsocket from places like Pawtucket. <laughs> And they created a group, a special squad, they called it the special squad, in the police department. And the first place they targeted was the Zanzibar. And at the Zanzibar, they did fun things like send the cops in 10 times in one night to ID everybody in the place, even if they were 60 years old, just to make sure they weren't underage drinking. They had searchlights that they would flash at customers going in or coming out. That didn't work. They stayed in business and so did the other queer places. And so they tried something else. They, in Rhode Island, it was illegal to dance on Sunday in an establishment that served alcohol. Not for gay people. Not for same gender couples, for every single person, it was illegal to dance in an alcohol, a place with alcohol. And so, oddly, the police kept going to the places that were nice to gay people. And they would show up at midnight, and the clock would click to 12.02 when it was Sunday morning. And so they went after them for allowing people to dance. And guess what, that didn't work either. And then, this was my favorite one. Some of these licenses were cafe licenses, which meant that they could serve food. And the rule was you were supposed to open at 9 a.m. if you served food. And so they went after two clubs, the Holiday Inn, and the Mirror Bar, because they weren't opening at 9 a.m. And they tried that, but guess what? There were a whole lot of street clubs that weren't opening at 9 a.m. to serve food, and that didn't work. And so finally, they went after a club called the Holiday Inn. And the Holiday Inn was on Mill Street, near the uh, Christmas Ornament Factory. And at the Holiday Inn, they sent people in. Now, throughout all of this, they were trying to tag people on underage drinking and all that kind of stuff. But they sent people into the neighborhood and they recruited the neighbors. And they got the neighbors to testify that things were happening in the street outside of the Holiday Inn. And the things that were happening according to the record, were boys kissing boys, embracing and dancing in the street, and girls kissing girls, embracing and dancing in the street. And on one Sunday morning, apparently there were some feminine garments that were found in the street, and you can figure out how it is that somebody's bra ended up on the street, Mill Street. Let's hope she had fun. Right? And they took, they tried to suspend their license for six months. Six months will kill an organization like that. Six months without income for a bar is a death knell. And the owner took that to the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And he said, it's none of your business what my patrons do in my club and you are harassing them for being who they are. And I wish I could tell you that there is a wonderful, happy story and he won. He didn't win. But let me tell you when that was. That was in 1963. There were queer people in Woodsocket in 1963, 
do the math, that's 60 years ago. And they were willing to stand up and they were willing to go to the Rhode Island Supreme Court and they were willing to piss off the Woonsocket police and the Woonsocket mayor. So I ask you to do this one thing on a very chilly June day. Two weeks from today in Providence, Rhode Island, Rhode Island Pride will happen. Please come. Our theme this year is simple. Remember, we are not the first, we will not be the last, but it is our turn to make a difference. Resist. They may tell you all sorts of things. Don't listen to them and don't let them convince anybody else. Resist. And the third thing, the third thing is rejoice. Dance in the goddamn streets, please. Thank you so, so much, Kate. All right. Leah, if you want to come up. Um, so I'm going to close this out. Um, I know it's cold. People are getting tired. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to just close out our stage tonight with a couple more words. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Alex Kithis. I'm the executive director of Rebuild One Socket, one of the organizations co-hosting today's Pride. Uh, can I get another round of applause for all of our incredible speakers and performers? Woo! Woo! So, a couple housekeeping things. Um, there's a ton of Pride swag, flags, and bracelets like the one I'm wearing up on the rebuild table, and there's swag and resources at all the tables around the park. So please, go grab some stuff. Um, and that kind of segues into what I was gonna say, which is today's event is about gathering together in queer joy about recognizing the incredible strides that our LGBTQ community has made over the decades, about celebrating our ability and our right to be open and proud about who we are and who we love, about gathering with loved ones, allies, and community organizations to share resources and learn how we can get involved and continue changing the world for the better. Today is about joy and celebration. Today is also about struggle and solidarity. The strides that our community has made, the rights that we've organized and fought for, they were not free. They came at a price. They came with blood, sweat, and tears, violence committed against us by the government and by the far right. Our rights were won through activism and organizing, not freely given by those in power. I want to say that again. Our rights never came because we asked nicely. Where we are today, the strides that we've made over the decades, they came because our community, our communities rose up and demanded better. These gains are thanks to the queer activists throughout history, to the queer and trans women, many of them black and brown, who fought back against police raids and state-sanctioned violence in Stonewall, New York, 54 years ago. And around the country, including, as Kate just talked about, right here in Woonsocket, um, across the decades. Our rights come from activists and organizers who continue to lift up our community's voices, organizing people power and rising up to demand better. We've made serious strides, and for that, we absolutely should celebrate. But today, we find ourselves at a precarious and danger dangerous moment in history. A militant, fascist right wing has grown in our country. They've played the long game, taking over seats in government and targeting our poor community. And most often, our trans community members with dangerous rhetoric, calls to violence, and legislative attacks. This is happening right here in Rhode Island with anti-trans bills currently introduced in the Rhode Island General Assembly. This is happening right here in this House District where we currently stand. My House District, which is represented by John Brian, a transphobic, yes, boom, a transphobic, queerphobic monster who uses his elevated public voice to harm our community. And this has happened for years in Woonsocket. For years, the mayor and the former city council have used every dirty fucking trick in the book to fight against our queer community, to fight against our movement, to fight against the people of Woonsocket. Things 
do seem to be changing, though. New city council members have been very clear with me on their commitment to support us today, to support our right to be here. And so we must continue our organizing work. We must continue to get involved and to donate and to, to link up with all the organizations that we see around here today to continue making change. We must vote, we must protest, we must speak up because we are our only hope. That's not me, I swear. That was, that was literally it, the end of my speech, so that was so anticlimactic. <laughs> so, um, one last thing. Um, I am totally open to offering what I was planning, a local and state government, like how it works kind of training. Um, I, it's obviously cold, and a lot of you probably already know that stuff, so I will go off to the side of the stage. Come to me if you want the training. Otherwise, thank you all for being here. Lady, did you want to say any final words? Just thank you for being here, and I love OneSocket so much. So thank you all, and thank you all.